Our scripture reading today is found in John 15, 1 through 11. I will be reading from the New Living Translation. I am the true grapevine, and my father is the gardener. He cuts off every branch of mine that doesn't produce fruit, and he prunes the branches that do bear fruit so they will produce even more. You have already been pruned and purified by the message I have given you. Remain in me, and I will remain in you. For a branch cannot produce fruit if it is severed from the vine, and you cannot be fruitful unless you remain in me. Yes, I am the vine, you are the branches. Those who remain in me and I in them will produce much fruit. From apart from me, you can do nothing. Anyone who does not remain in me is thrown away like a useless branch and withers. Such branches are gathered into a pile to be burned. But if you remain in me and my words remain in you, you may ask for anything you want and it will be granted. When you produce my fruit, when you produce much fruit, you are my true disciples. This brings great glory to my Father. I have loved you even as the Father has loved me. Remain in my love. When you obey my commandments, you remain in my love, just as I obey my Father's commandments and remain in his love. I have told you these things so that you will be filled with my joy. Yes, your joy will overflow. May God bless the reading of the scripture. April 1, 2018, yes, I know it's April Fool's Day, was the day that I got married with the love of my life. It was a day that I always, well, always remember, I hope I will always remember it, but it's a day that I could think of where I was at the altar and I was holding Jolene's hand and I was just thinking of all the things that we'll have together the joys, the laughter, not being able to do things by myself. Now I could do it with my partner. But no one ever tells you about the days after the wedding. You know, the honeymoon stage is great, but when that's over, life continues. And so we were married in San Diego, and we drove all the way back to L.A., to my st small studio apartment. I had no space to have another person live with me. Quite literally, it's just one, two huge steps, and that's the end of my living room, slash kitchen, slash bedroom, slash living room, slash bathroom. There was no space for my new wife. I didn't, wasn't used to living all... I wasn't, I'm not used to living with someone. And I remember so clearly, I have a twin bed, and me and Jeline are trying to find a way to get comfortable in this small bed as now a married couple. We kept moving and squirming. We kept trying to get in this way. It wasn't a Nicholas Sparks romantic moment. It's not a way where he's... We were all like lovey-dovey. I remember so clearly in the morning, I woke up and immediately I saw her face. And for some odd reason, I thought that was a stranger. <laughs> I looked at her face and I kid you not, I screamed out loud, ah! <laughs> and Julie was wondering, what happened? What's wrong? Like, I am just not used to you being here. For the longest time of my life, I've never had someone in bed with me. How do I live with someone when I've only lived for myself? Let me say that again. How do I live with someone when I've only lived for myself? I thought about the meals that I would cook for myself, the places I would eat, the places I would do. Mm, maybe I want to go for a run. I'll go. But now that I'm, we're a married couple, I have to think about what does she like to do? What would she like to eat? What would we, you want to do for date nights? 
It was so hard for my mind to wrap around the fact that now I'm not living for myself, but I'm also living for someone else. And plot twist, when you have kids, that just, your whole self and what you want to do is out the window. That's right, right? How do I live with someone when I've only lived for myself? You see, in our sermon series, and I'm so thankful for this sermon series because it has been exactly what I have needed to hear in my stage in my life. We are making room for what matters most. And in our last message, we are learning how to make room for someone to live with us and to abide with us. In fact, Jesus gives us a tutorial of how to live life with him. Turn with me to John chapter 15. John chapter 15 can be found in your church bulletin. We'll be reading from the ESV version. Feel free to read it in any version that you like. Open up your Bible, open up your phone, your iPad, whatever it be, just I want you to be able to read it for yourself. John 15, and we are looking at verse 1. Verse 1, it reads, I am the true vine, and my father is the vine dresser. Every branch of me that does not bear fruit, he takes away. And every branch that does not bear fruit, he prunes that it may bear more fruit. Already you are clean because of the word that I have spoken to you. Verse 4, abide in me and I in you. As a branch cannot bear fruit by itself unless it abides in the vine, neither can you unless you abide in me. I am the vine, you are the branches. Whoever abides in me and I in him, he it is that bears much fruit. For apart from me, you can do nothing. If anyone does not abide in me, he is thrown away like a branch and withers. And the branches are gathered, thrown into the fire, and burned. If you abide in me and my words abide in you, ask whatever you wish, and it will be done for you. By this my Father is glorified that you bear much fruit, and so prove to be my disciples. Verse 9. As the, fathers had, as the Father has loved me, so have I loved you. Abide in my love. If you keep my commandments, you will abide in my love, just as I have kept my Father's commandments and abide in his love. These things I have spoken to you, that my joy may be in you, and that your joy may be full. This is the last night of Jesus' time with his disciples. And he is making this teaching of, about this vineyard. And Jesus is saying he is the vine, and who are the branches? The branches are the disciples. And he's making this claim that there is nothing you could do without me as the vine. We are connected to the vine. And Jesus, or the vine dresser, prunes us in order to make fruits. In fact, a vineyard is not meant to be left haphazard, but in order to have more fruit and to have produced fruit, one needs to tend for it. One needs to care for it so that fruit may produce. And there is one word that he says 10 times. What do you think that word is? The word starts with the letter A. The word is abide. Verse 4 tells us that abide in me and I in you. In the Greek word for abide is meno. Can you say that with me? Meno. And to, to give the definition, because when it translates into English, sometimes it gets lost in translations, as you may say. And things get lost in translation, and meno means to stay. Meno means to dwell. Meno also means to remain. Not only is there a physical component of being present, but even when the disciples were talking to Jesus when he started his ministry, the disciples, or soon-to-be disciples, were asking him, Jesus, teacher, or rabbi, where are you staying? The same word found in verse 4, meno. Jesus, where are you abiding? Where are you remaining? 
So we see here that it's not only a physical presence, but there is also a relational aspect of what Jesus is trying to teach. That this meno is not only physically present, but relationally present. I could think of all the relationships I have. You know, the time when you meet up with your family or friends that you haven't seen for years, just seeing them gives you overwhelming joy. Guess what? That's meadow. That's abiding. When you, as a grandparent, is spending time in the Philippine, Filipino language with your oppo or with your grandkids, and you see them smiling and running after you and say, Grandma, Grandpa, Lola, Lolo, that, my friends, is metal. That's abiding. That's remaining. When you have that uninterrupted time with your spouse or someone you just love so dearly and you just spend time with each other to the point that even conversations don't need to be had, just the presence alone with that loved one, friends, that's metal. That's abiding. That's dwelling, that's remaining. And Jesus is saying to us to abide in him and I in you. So with this relational aspect, one can even define it this way. Make your home in me as I make my home in you. Now, how is that for us today? How could I abide in him when I am so busy? My schedule is like filled to the brim. Have you seen what today is? Not only am I preaching, there's also Pathfinder Ductions, there's Operation Christmas Child, there's also Pathfinder Lock-In. How do I have space for him when I am so busy? How about in your own life? You literally have no room to spare for him. Just like when that story, when there was no room for that one person going on the way. How about if you have no time? How does it look like to abide? You see, the point that Jesus is trying to say is this. Jesus isn't asking you to do something you're not already doing. You see, the fact is, all of us are abiding. The question isn't, are you abiding? It's what are you abiding in? We live in a digital age. For me, sometimes abiding is doom scrolling. Have you ever heard that term before? Doom scrolling where all of a sudden you're just scrolling up and up and up and up, finding that one video, getting that dopamine release, and you keep going and going and going, and all of a sudden it's like 2 a.m. and you have done nothing. What you abide in, you become. And if you are doom scrolling, looking on your social media, you know what that forms in your life, in your, in your mind, in your heart? Well, it causes you to be anxious. It causes you to be distracted. That in that random time of life, when maybe when you're waiting, or maybe when you're at that stoplight, or when you're just doing nothing, rather than just staying slow and being present in the moment, you're just scrolling and scrolling, scrolling and scrolling. You are distracted and you become a slave to the algorithm. What else are you abiding in? Maybe you're abiding in the endless queue of shows to watch on your streaming services. There's this thing called entertainment anxiety. Have you ever heard that before? That there's quite literally way too much media to consume. That when you hear of someone talking about a certain show, a certain drama, a certain K-drama, a certain watch movie, or whatever it be, you get that anxiety because you feel like you need to watch it. And what does that abide in you? What happens in your life? What happens when you are formed in that? Well, you become restless. You become bored. Things that are slow. Reading a book is so boring. Give me something with shoot, that's shooting up in the air, cannons firing. Give me someone jumping, doing trampoline jump or something. But slowing down, reading words on a book does not work for my fast-paced mind. We're never present in the now. What if you're abiding in catching the latest trend? 
Then you become more addictive to finding that one thing that will give you that release, give you that high. You become so compulsive in your thoughts, and you're running from pain as well as simultaneously running from the healing. You see, we are all abiding in things. Jesus is not telling us something that we aren't already doing. You do it whether you know it or not. In the way you eat, in the way you consume your media, in the way you dress up, the things you love as hobbies, the activities you do with friends, we are all abiding. The question is, what are you abiding in? And abiding, when we abide in what matters most, making room for what really matters in our life, when we make room for God, verse 4 tells us a promise that I want you to hear. Verse 4 tells us, abide in me, remain in me, dwell with me, stay with me, make a home for me. And what is Jesus' promise? Jesus' promise is that when we abide in him, he abides, makes a room for who? For us. And the reward is not answered prayers. The reward is not wealth. The reward is not popularity. The reward is not fame, fortune. The reward is something slow, but something that our heart is deeply longing for and wanting for in our life. And that deep longing for is none other than Jesus. The deep longing in our heart that when we abide, make room and make a home for him, Jesus is present in the reality. Jesus is present in the now. Whatever you're going through, when, you life, when life feels like shifting sands, and you feel like there's that sort of anxiety where you just feel like going through the motions, I'm here to let you know Jesus is in your presence. That slow presence. That presence that gives you comfort. That presence that gives you peace. That presence that gives you assurance that whatever happens come election day, whatever assurance that's going to happen in whatever that's going to happen in the future, we can be assured to know that we're standing on firm foundation. When we abide in him, he abides in us. And the result of abiding in him, making room for him, making a home for him, he abides in us. And then verse 8 tells us this, by this my father is glorified that you bear much fruit. And so prove to be my disciples by spending time with him, ruminating on his beauty, on his glory, taking the time to just maybe sitting down and just seeing the leaves sway back and forth as the fall, beautiful colors are falling down ever so slowly. In those moments, we are able to allow Jesus to enter in the inside, the deepest parts of our heart. And all of a sudden, what becomes something that we have been longing for for years, for decades, something that want, we want to be changed in our anxiety, anxiety-filled mind, our stress-filled mind, a full of fear, guilt, and, a sh and shame, enters now love, joy, peace, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. That is how we know that we are his disciples. That the, that's a litmus test if we know we are disciples of, of Jesus. Are we portraying love to our kids? Do we show that self-control to that one coworker who just continues to be that thorn in the flesh? Are we showing patience when that person who has a differing opinion continues rubbing shoulders against you each and every time. See, this is the litmus test of those who abide in Christ. That when Christ abides in you, Jesus changes you from the inside and you have all the fruit of the Spirit. 
In fact, Jesus knew that this would take time. Last Sabbath, if you haven't watched it, go, feel free to go on our YouTube. But life, our walk with God, takes time. It's not immediate. It's a process. It takes time. It's a process, and it's for sure not immediate. In fact, Jesus' first message, it took him 30 years to finally preach his message. Can you imagine someone asking you to preach, and they said, okay, when you're 50, you could preach your first message. For years, Jesus has been thinking about what is the message that he needs to preach, the message that he needs to tell to this world full of sin, sinners and sickness and destruction. What is it that he needs to share? And then all of a sudden, in his Sermon on the Mount, the very first thing that he says is this, Matthew 5, verse 19, just hear it in my reading. Whoever practices, say that with me, practices. Whoever practices and teaches these commands will be called great in the kingdom of heaven. And then on the book end of the Sermon on the Mount, as he ends his very first message, he says this, Matthew 7, verse 24, therefore, everyone who hears these words of mine and puts them into practice is like a wise man who built his house on the rock. You see, Jesus knew full well that we need to practice this, that we have been living in the lie of Satan and whatever we think is supposedly right in our eyes. When Jesus has come to shatter and take out all these layers for us to see what true reality is. Reality is not me, me, me. It's loving God and loving others. And Jesus is showing that this practice takes time. You're not gonna, it's not going to be quick to love that person you hate. It's not going to be quick to have that self-control when you have this addiction that when you see that one picture, that when you hear that one song, you get instantly triggered. It's going to take time. It's a process, and it's not immediate. Last Sabbath, Jalene went and my two boys went to the Ark Encounter in Kentucky, and I have been pretty much with our kids and living life together pretty much every day. I know the motions of waking them up, putting them down for bed, getting them ready to eat, chasing my old, old, oldest to get him to eat with a spoon, just <laughs> getting him to eat whatever food we're eating. I know the motions. And then all of a sudden, when Jesus, uh, when Jesus, Jeline left on Friday morning, I was all to myself. I literally did not know what to do with myself. I had so much anxiety. Well, I could do this. I could do that. I could watch this. I could play that. I could hang out with my friends. I could go in the city. I could eat food. I could do this. I had so much anxiety because I literally had so much time for myself. Come Saturday night. Saturday night, I could do whatever I want. And amazingly, and I'm not saying this to boast myself, but I only watched one movie. Back when I was a teenager, I would watch a movie after another and I would not sleep. I would play all the types of games that I had on my, on my console. I would do whatever I want and I would stay the night but I was so sleepy. I slept at 7 p.m. I know I'm getting old when I sleep at 7 p.m. And then on Sunday, guess what I did? I exercised, and dare I say, I even read a book. What? Back then, I would have never read a book. They're so boring. It's so slow. And here I am, I'm reading a book. I exercised. I took the time to just sit on my patio and I just sat down. See, the reason why I'm sharing with this, sharing you with this, is because it takes time. I never thought in a million years that 15-year-old Rodney, now all the way to 34, is a man is a 
man who actually reads a book and slows down in life. It takes time. It's a process. It is not immediate. And this whole sermon series has taught me the exact truth of what it means to slow down. Our life is busy. Can you agree? Is your life busy? Are you full of worry? This sermon series has taught me to slow down and to see what is really important in our lives. You see, this practice, it's something that we need to do slowly. And the more we do it, the more we continue to work on it, the more we continue to walk with God and continue to set our eyes and abide in Him, the more we become like His character. The more we continue to persevere, and the, through perseverance comes maturity, and become, with maturity becomes our character. You see, it's a habit. And Dallas Willard tells us this. The first, this is a theologian, Dallas Willard tells us this when it, in regards to our habit. The first and most basic thing we can and must do is to keep God before our minds. This is the fundamental secret of caring for our souls. Our part is thus practicing the presence of God is to direct and redirect our minds constantly to Him. In the early time of our practicing, we, we may well be challenged by our burdensome habits of dwelling on things less than God. That is, we'll be constantly distracted by a million other things, but these are habits not the law of gravity, and it can be broken. A new grace-filled habit will replace the formal ones as we take intentional steps towards keeping God before us. And I love this part. Soon, our minds will return to God as a needle of a compass constantly returns to the north. If God is the great longing of your souls, he will become the pole star of our inward being. You see, it may be difficult to break and kick that old habit goodbye. Maybe you just have this habit that you think, I will have this for all eternity. No matter how hard I try, no matter how hard I do, whatever I do, it continues to persist. This habit will never leave me. But according to Dallas Willard, it says that even though this difficult habit, it is not the law of gravity. It can change. It can be broken. And what was a bad habit, you could flip it into a good habit. And I love this idea that these habits, that when we make our habits towards God, it's like a compass moving into our true north. That when we continue following the path, following the way, practicing in devotional life, prayer, spending time in community like Sabbath, by doing this consistently, it allows our life to sink up to our deepest longing and allows us to go to the true north of what it means to follow God. You see, habits, they're not a way to control God. They're not a way to control God. When we pray, it's not praying as if it's a vending machine. We're not praying to someone like it's Santa Claus. Habits like prayer and devotional life are not ways so that we can control God. We can mold Him. We can manipulate Him. He is not a vending machine. We don't pray to get the results we desire. The reward for spending time with Jesus by abiding in Him, the reward is time with Him. That's it. The slowness of life, being with the one person that our heart is longing for. Habits are also not a way to earn merit. We don't go to church to make our, our, our one step closer to God. I always hear people tell us, tell me, talk to my daughter, talk to my son. Get them to church as if the, going to church is the solution to what they really need. When the solution is what they really need is a heart transformation in their life. It's not a way to earn our, and 
find a merit to get our way to God. Salvation is in Christ alone. Habits are the path, not the destination. And it gives us an opportunity to make space for our heart to open to Him. Habits are also not a way to virtue signal. I love that parable that Jesus describes of this Pharisee who comes to church and literally says, look at me, I tithe more than anybody else. Can you imagine someone standing up and say, look at all these hooligans, I, I give all my money, but look at this guy over here. Yeah, that guy, I'm pointing to you. And all of a sudden, he contrasts it in the parable of a man who's a tax collector, who is an enemy of the Jewish people. And he dare not even enter into the temple. And he's beating his chest, not even willing to look up because he knows that he is not worthy in the sight of all these people who claim to worship God. And Jesus says, this man who walks humbly, this is the worship I honor. You see, habits of devotional life, devotional practices. Prayer is not a way to virtue signal and say, look, I fasted for a whole week. Post it on Instagram, post it on Facebook, let everyone know, do my devotion, put it on Facebook and say, I took my time in prayer. It's not a way to virtue signal and say, look at me. In fact, doing so is like an infectious parasite to our walk with God. Because God's kingdom is all about humility. But here's the thing. What habits aren't, this is what habits truly is. It's a way for us to be available to God. Our habits do not form us into the image of Jesus. But as we allow space in our life, taking time to slow down and to be with Him, We allow the Holy Spirit to transform us from the inside out. Our job, and I want you to hear this this clearly, devotional life, practicing by prayer, going to church, being in community, your job is to be available. It's not your ability, but your availability. For example, morning time is a sacred time because it's you literally waking up for the first time in the day. These are sacred moments. And for me personally, I try not to look at my phone. We are in a digital age of digital distractions. And what I try to do, let me share you with some of my practices. I try to put my phone away. And then when I, once I wake up, I immediately stand, go to my sofa, And I open the Word of God and let the Word of God dictate my very first thoughts. In the evening, just before you're going to bed, what is it that you do to go to sleep? What is it that you do before you go to bed? Do you watch that show? Maybe you you eat, maybe you brush your teeth, but I encourage you, take those moments to make space for what really matters most. Spend time with your spouse. Take that time to just declutter your mind and just defrag and just process what's going on. Say thank you for what God has done. Go through that your day and just just say thank you. These are moments that we make space so that these habits will open ourselves to the Holy Spirit. And how about those random times? Those random times when you're at the stoplight. Those random times when you're waiting in line at Starbucks, those times when you're just doing nothing, don't go straight to your phone. Maybe take that time in prayer. And when I protect my time, I am more aware of my presence with God. These are the habits. What are habits? Also, it's also a way to be intentional in becoming the person I want to be intentionality. We put so much intentionality. I remember getting a degree. I, there was a lot of intentionality, making sure I got the right classes, making sure I booked time with my counselor, booked time with my advisor, making sure I, made, 
I went to the finance to make sure that all my things are cleared. There is a level of intentionality in school in order to get your degree. If you have a hobby, you have intentionality of practicing your guitar, practicing your violin. You have intentionality of going to the hair cuttery to get your hair cut. You have intentionality of driving to a certain location. You have to get your clothes on. You have to brush your teeth. You have to fix your hair. You have to put your glasses on. You have to make sure you have your phone, your wallet. There's a level of intentionality for everything, and yet we are so haphazard when it comes to our intentionality with our devotional life and our practices with God. Why is that? There is no accidental sainthoods. We don't just trip and all of a sudden we become perfect. See, this walk with God is truly a walk with God. It takes time. It's a process, and it's not immediate. If you want to find the deepest longing in your soul, I encourage you, take the time to slow down. Take that thoughtful five minutes, 10 minutes, whatever you have, at least it is something to spend time with God and to remember that it is through Him and abiding in Him we may get His presence. So Instagram algorithm got me really well um, because I have been in this process and this journey of being more intentional with my time, my digital footprint, taking the time. I've even, I've even been thinking about buying a dumb phone. Have you guys heard of that? I've been trying to really be intentional with my time, with my family, with my wife, with my two kids, being present at home, being present in my youth ministry with the parents and my everything, just everything, that all of a sudden I got an algorithm of this advertisement, hashtag not an ad, but this thing called Brick. Have you got an ad for this at all on Instagram, on Facebook? Now that I'm saying this, I'm sure your phones are hearing this. You're probably going to get this out right after service. But there's this thing called Brick, and it has been amazing because I realized if you're on an iPhone, you could look how much screen time you have. I spend on my phone six hours a day. Can you believe that? Now, granted, I am on YouTube majority <laughs> of the time listening to sermons or listening to some podcasts, but six hours of my day on the phone. Now, it might be scary to go on your phone and see exactly how many hours you spend. And if it's better than me, good on you. Maybe I, I, I'm more of an exception than the rule. But l listen to this. On average, people touch their phones 2,617 times per day. Do you agree with that? Do you agree with us touching our phone, just holding it? Or maybe when you want to look at something real quick. It's amazing how often we are so addicted to the phone. In fact, social media, it's free. You know why? Because you're the product. They're selling you information, contents, and the more you continue spending time on it, the more money they receive. And so it tells us, well, for me, just going back to this object, this allows me to brick my phone. There's a term where you brick something on technical terms, technology terms, where when you brick something, it's completely dead. So I tap it, it's on the, on the NFC reader, and it bricks my phone, and I am more intentional with my time, especially when I sermon prep. It's like the time where I get even more distracted. So I brick my phone, and it's amazing. I've noticed a complete drastic change of my time on my phone and on my social, on my social media. And Fra Victor Frankl, he granted this is a psychologist who came from the concentration camps, who, was a Jew, who came, went through Holocaust. This is what he says. The greatest freedom a human will ever have is what we do with our mind. You see, they could take your, you could, they could take your freedom. They, take, they could take anything of you, of you, but they cannot 
take your mind. Now, granted, this is a guy who came from the Holocaust, who went to concentration camp. And so there is a lot of power with what you do with your mind. We must intentionally learn to curate our consciousness. You know what that means, curating? It's like when someone curates a museum. Someone makes a museum and they pick specific pieces to showcase. We need to curate our minds because our minds is going to and fro, full of anxiety and fear, shame, guilt. With all this thing that's happening in this world, we need to protect our mind to be sure that we have the opportunity to make space for Jesus to abide in us. Another way that habits are is that it also is a way to surrender our hearts to the everyday motions of life. See, the point of habits is not for merit. It's not for salvation. It's not for virtue signaling. Habits and devotional practices and prayer and time with God and communion with Him and Sabbath keeping and ch keeping church, by doing this, it allows our heart to surrender to His will. You see, when I drive, I take those moments to give my plans to him. It's easy for me to go straight to the, the latest thing on my subscription, um, script, subscription role on my YouTube or Instagram to listen or to watch, but I had to take that intentional time to spend time with him and to surrender my God, surrender my life and my plans to him. And then finally, habits are also a way to allow me to be present to my true reality. You see, we have been living the lie that anxiety is supposed to be a part of our life, that depression is supposed to be something that we need to go through, that this life of hurry and this fast-paced Western life in this American life of do this, do that, do this, do that. Get a degree, get a job, now get married, get kids, have more kids, get more kids again. Now work on your own degree, do this, this, this. It's over and over and over again when our true reality is right in front of us. The love that we have been longing for, the thing that we've been craving for for so much is truly found in the depths of the word found in Jesus Christ. That through Jesus Christ, he opens up a portal. He opens up the reality of what life shall, should really be. Slow. Time with family. Time with the people we care for. Living a life full of interruptions, not thinking that they are burdens, but divine blessings to be able to bless those in need. Time to be slow. That though there may be struggles in life, through the struggles and through the pain, we get a full or more sense of what it means to cling on to Jesus when we have nothing left. That when we surrender our hearts to him and see the true reality of what Jesus gives us, life on this world is temporary and is not exactly what we need. Jesus is giving us this option to open up our eyes. Once I was blind, but now I see of the beauty of what it means to follow Jesus, to practice in the ways that he calls us to live, to love our neighbors, to love our enemies, to have the golden rule, to be in presence and in reality, to have all the fruit of the Spirit, the weeks that we have with Pastor Nestor, sharing what it means to be more loving, to be more kind, to, be, to have more self-control, to be more faithful. It's to be in true reality. And the easiest way, my friends, to do that is to have that moment in gratitude. 
by saying thank you opens up our hearts to what is really going on in our life. I'm thankful for life. I'm thankful for my family. I'm thankful for my kids. I'm thankful for this journey I, I'm in as a pastor. I'm thankful for the friends I've met along the way. I'm thankful for all the experiences that I faced, good and bad. I'm thankful for the encounters I've had with strangers. I'm thankful for this body that God has given me. I'm thankful for the, this place I currently reside in, the location I live in here in the United States. I'm thankful for church. I'm thankful for being a, a seven-day Adventist. I'm thankful for being a Christian. You could go down the line, and the more you are gra grateful for all the things that are in your life, the more you are open to the true reality that this is not our home. And as John 14 tells us, he is making a place for me, a room, a space to live a life not in a rush, not in a hurry, but to see all these things slowly, not, as a sh not to see these struggles as pains, but as a way to trust in God. As we close, I challenge all of us here today to go through these practices. And they're not thought experiments. It's not just residing in our heart. But let it fall 18 inches down to our heart. To not only be in these devotional practices, not only to know God, but to know God. To experience Him. And so I want to close by reading verse 9. Verse 9, I'm going back to John chapter 15. John chapter 15, verse 9, and reads, As a father has loved me, so I love, have, have I loved you. Abide in my love. Jesus was able to do everything he can for those three short years in his ministry to be interrupted, to heal, to cast out demons, to create a motley crew of 12 disciples to share to the then known world because he knew he had time in the Father, in the garden, in the wilderness, time for himself to pray to the Father. And through those thoughtful silence, he knew his Father loved him. And in that verse, it says, as the Father has loved me, so I have loved you. This self-perpetual love continues on and on and never ends that the Father's love goes to the Savior, Jesus, and it comes down to me. And when I reside in that presence, as he, I abide in him and he abides in me, as I make a room for him, a home for him, and he makes a room for me, my body, my space becomes a place that I could allow the Holy Spirit to dwell in my heart. And in that moment, even though it may take an hour, even in that hour, that one minute of that time, I feel the presence of God because I have realized, wow, what he did on that cross, that love like no other, to send his own son to die on the cross for me? A sinner who continues to fall continually to my addictions and my issues? The times where I feel anxious and I don't feel like trusting him? Me? You died for me? And in those sweet moments, now I could say thank you. Because when the Father has loved Jesus and Jesus has loved me, I am more aware, more attuned to the unconditional love, the mercy and the grace Jesus has been given me in my life. 
So I want to do this. It's not often we do this. But last Sabbath, I shared with the idea of intentionality and being willing to choose. I want to give you the challenge and the opportunity. If this series has touched your heart like none other, as it has touched me in my practices with God, to be more intentional with my time with you as, as, my, as, my, um, as, my, as my people, as my loved ones, with my family and with my kids, I want to challenge you. If this is your decision to follow Jesus full on, to abide in him so that you can get the beautiful presence of him, this is not for everyone. I challenge you to stand up. I challenge you to make that final decision, that choice to intentionally move forward. And it's going to be hard. I know it. I know you feel kind of now tense because you now think about other people. You're thinking about what may, people may think. I may be the only one, but I want you to think nobody but just Jesus and your relationship with God. It takes a level of intentionality. It takes a level of surrender. And it takes a level of being mindful and open to what God is calling you to do. So if that is you today, challenge you to stand. Choose Christ today. Choose Him. Finally, make that decision to continue to make room for the person who wants nothing but to spend time with you. Our praise team is going to come up. The next step now I'm sure all of us are standing now. But there's a QR code. If you want to take that next final step to be more intentional with your walk with God, connect with us. Find that true reality of choosing Jesus. Connect by scanning that QR code. That's a QR code in the fuse as well. Let us know how we could walk with you so that we may be in that journey. It's going to take time. It's a process. It's not immediate. But when the reward comes, it will be so satisfying and it is so deep and it will be exactly what we need. Let's sing to the God who makes room for us.